Good day, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Guillaume Massonclair. I'm a senior economist at TIPS that's trained in industrial policy strategies. We're an economic policy research institute based in South Africa. It really is my, my pleasure uh, to, to be here today to, to share some thoughts on, on a concept that many talk about, but few uh, actually truly understand the just transition. To begin, imagine South Africa in 2050. Imagine a society that is economically dynamic, socially inclusive, environmentally sustainable. In brief, a vision aligned with our current national development plan. Of course, achieving such a future would require quite a departure from where we are today um, due to our current situation of a very unequal society, a carbon intensive economy, and the important role of vested interest as well. But indeed, the transition is underway, driven primarily, I would say, by climate change dynamics, as well as um, the fourth industrial revolution. And like every transition, it is disruptive. It brings risks, it brings opportunities, and everyone is impacted either through biophysical impacts, things like droughts and change in weather patterns, or transition impacts through finance, policy, and markets. And that's certainly the case of South Africa and uh, its energy sector. But while the end goal is paramount, you know, given where we are today and where we want to be tomorrow, the journey matters as much as the destination. Indeed, people, communities, companies, and countries have different abilities to respond and adapt to disruption. That has led to calls for a just transition. It is premised on an ambitious development pathway that is compatible with the requirements of a you know, world of plus 1.5 degrees compared to our pre-industrial era, but adds a really important layer it aims to ensure that vulnerable stakeholders are better off through the transition process, or at least not negatively impacted by it. And this is what NEDLAC has come to consensus about. A shift towards a low carbon, climate resilient, and ecologically sustainable economy and society, which contributes to the creation goals of decent work for all, social inclusion, and the eradication of poverty. <clears throat> But then let's get into who is at risk. Who is the trust transition about? We can think about it in terms of key sectors and areas. First, it's about mono economy towns, you know, towns that depend on one particular facility or one economy. It is also about rural towns, you know, that, that tends to have strong linkages as well with, with sectors like mining or, or, or agriculture. Third, uh, it's about sectors that need to or are currently decarbonizing. That includes our electricity sector, but also liquid fuels, the automotive value chain, and AV industry. Last but not least, it's also about sectors and areas impacted by climate change biophysical impacts. That includes agriculture, tourism, but also low-lying areas. If we look at it in terms of stakeholders, it extends from workers and of course communities that rely on particular activities to consumers and citizens. Uh, and it has a whole society approach effectively to just transition. Let's think about what are the dimensions of a just transition? What do we mean by just transition? They effectively three dimensions of transitional justice that we look at. The first one is procedural justice. It focuses on the form and aims at facilitating an inclusive process. The second is distributive justice. It builds here with the direct impact of the transition. It aims to address the loss of jobs, the loss of livelihood resulting from the transition. Importantly though, particularly in South Africa, we add a third dimension, which is restorative justice. It looks at the damages against individuals, communities, and the environment, and takes a bit more of a historical perspective, a long-term perspective on, on the transition, 
in a way, is trying to right historical wrongs. Importantly, we need to also understand the degree of ambition that we pursue through a just transition. We have to recognize the fact that some stakeholders, although there are less and less of them, are still opposing or resisting or trying to hinder the transition. But for the bulk, stakeholders have now bought into the agenda. Yet, they mean different things. Some pursue low level of ambition through kind of marginal reforms, looking more at the consequences of the transition than the roots, while others have a highly transformative agenda trying to deeply transform the socioeconomic and sociopolitical system to really address the roots of some of the issues. <clears throat> we need to acknowledge that a just transition process is only truly effective and transformative in its most ambitious version. And that's when we're trying to really achieve procedural, distributive, and restorative justice. And when we merge that with, of course, uh, a strong justice agenda. Realistically, though, in practice, any just transition would result from a mix of measures encompassing a variety of approaches through a series of incremental building blocks. And that's important to also understand that we're looking at a spectrum of action um, to go from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow. <clears throat> but let's delve a little deeper into those three dimensions of justice and what we mean by them. First, procedural justice. As I indicated, it's about the process. It's about the assumption that we need a just process, an inclusive process to achieve a just outcome. So it's really looking at facilitating an inclusive decision-making and implementation process going forward. In South Africa, we have a rich history of grassroots bottom of democracy that comes from you know, the end of apartheid to the, 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 the fishing out of, of the democratic agenda. However, this, this grassroots spirit um, has been eroded um, with the shift to more kind of technocratic policy making. Um, and community structures as well have been weakened and somewhat with them, some of them moving into, into more implementation and, and, and government. Nonetheless, existing channels could provide the basis for a rekindling of citizen-led decision-making. And that's both open direct democracy as well as representative democracy. And if we can use them to find the right balance to bring in the power of organized constituencies, answer a desire for participatory and open procedures, but also bring in the, ex the evidence and the expertise, then um, we would have a, a recipe for uh, procedural justice going forward. In practice, we need to embody four principles. First, dignity and respect. That means that we need an inclusive public participation process. It's equal weight for all into the process. Everybody should be able to be heard. That speaks to voice. That speaks to voice, making sure that we have a bottom-up process that complements the current representative democratic processes and that stakeholders are empowered in participating at the community level, of course, but also at the firm level. We need a process that's neutral, impartial, and transparent. It needs to be evidence-based. And access to information must be equal and unrestricted, and that's really important. And it's to, to be trusted. Meaning it's not a tick box exercise. It has to be effectively ongoing, starting well before decisions are made, uh, and well after these have been implemented so that we can have uh, course correction if needed. Let's now look at distributive justice. It starts with labor market policies because as the transition unfolds, it disrupts the economic structures and labor market policies are critical and necessary to foster employment and decent work. In South Africa, we have got a wide range of labor market policies. They provide um, fundamental protections to, to many, um, but we have to acknowledge that labor market policies are mostly effective in environment characterized by low unemployment, high job creation, and economic dynamism, an environment that we do not have at the moment. Uh, and that has led to challenges when it comes to the implementation. 
uh, or the effectiveness of our labor market policies. Having said that, though, the existing policies do provide a degree of protection and support to workers, and these could formulate really the basis for just transition and a more inclusive labor market overall. The kind of policies that we talk about uh, are uh, retraining and risking schemes, job placement schemes, uh, income support, small business support, but also schemes to look at the transition out of labor force, like early retirement and retrenchment packages. That's on the active labor market policies uh, side. And then we have passive labor market policies that deal more with workers' benefits as well as employment conditions. So that's the kind of policies that we, that we look at from the labor market side. But if we acknowledge that labor market policies are necessary but insufficient, they need to be complemented. And they need to be complemented first by industrial policy. Industrial policy is required to drive investment and support the emergence of new opportunities. In South Africa, we've got a relatively strong industrial policy, and we've used every tool in the box to support or foster a transition to a green economy. That's true of our finance, our R&D support, special economic zones, our infrastructure, also, of course, our uh, regulations and carbon pricing. And we have many of those green shoots which we can build upon to support through industrial policy the transition to a green economy. However, the mix of measures lacks internal currents, long-term certainty, and uh, alignment with other public policy areas, particularly our energy policy. And that is something where we can improve to ensure that we do not have counterproductive interventions uh, and that we break away from a past dependency where industrial policy led us to the past we are today and takes us where we want to be tomorrow. Again, what are some of the measures that we can think about? We have functional industrial policy that looks at the market structure in terms of the market institutions, ownership, you know, the regulatory barriers and burdens, but also infrastructure. And we have selective industrial policy, looking at particular sectors, particular value chains, uh, and trying to provide support for finance, trade policy, skills development, but also just you know, kind of consensus building in, uh, uh, at a sectoral level. But yet again, um, you know, it needs to be complemented. And in this case, by social protection. Social protection is, is fundamental to bring a genuine safety net to workers and citizens at large. And that's really important to increase the resilience to climate change impact. South Africa is a widespread social protection system primarily through social grants, public employment and service provision. And it has made a, a massive dent into, into poverty, into the country. <clears throat> However, um, there are gaps in coverage and um, the levels of support are insufficient to enact a just transition. They still leave many vulnerable stakeholders in jeopardy of climate impact. If we can address those shortcomings going forward, this could really provide the basis for a comprehensive and empowering social security, starting with stakeholders vulnerable to climate impact, like in the coal value chain, uh, and uh, uh, to society as a whole going forward as well. In terms of interventions, we have uh, an overlap with labor market policies through the contributory social protections, which is the enactment of social insurance. And we have, importantly, a number of non-contributory social protection measures. These are uh, things like fee waivers for particular services, as well as subsidies for, for, for services, but also social transfers and in nature, in kind, or uh, in employment through uh, the public employment program, but also social care and the recognition of the care economy. Let's now look at uh, restorative justice, certainly uh, the most transformative dimension of just transition, which is a big focus in the South African context because of the country's history. It really aims to take a, a, an historical perspective, uh, looking at the economic, social, and environmental resilience of vulnerable stakeholders, activities, and, and regions. Uh, and, and South Africa has strong roots of restorative justice from the post-apartheid days. 
uh, and the early de democratic days. However, um, once more, the drive for restoration has been eroded over time. Uh, and we lived with a situation where many are uh, disenfranchised. That is true in terms of housing, in terms of access to municipal services, as well as community services, but also in terms of ownership and access to economic opportunities and access to, to land, for instance, with uh, issues around massive competition between mining and agriculture, for instance. A rekindling of the restorative justice agenda and spirit could provide the basis for achieving the more transformative transition. Here we're looking at pushing for socioeconomic empowerment, that is through access to modern housing and services, such as sustainable energy, access to new technologies, again, could be sort of based systems, but also things around social ownerships of plants and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and factories, as well as access to economic opportunities. It's about sociocultural restorations, which is really about ensuring a non predatory use of the land and considering the true value of land, nature, ecosystems, as well as local knowledge and practices and heritage. But it's also about access to health and education and safety. Effectively. Last and not least, it's about environmental restoration, of course, in the case of land, but also air and water. Looking ahead, we find that South Africa's just transition is very much in the making. Many foundations are present. Um, it is focused on energy for now, but it has been grounded within an economy and society-wide climate change ambit. Vulnerable stakeholders have been identified, and so have most of the policy tools and interventions that are necessary. What's more, those are known and have been tried and tested in the country. But these are yet to be meaningfully honest for an ambitious trust transition. This really could be achieved through a series of incremental building blocks to improve and increase a spectrum of action and ambition going forward. <laughs> Achieving a just transition will be an incremental process. It comes down to two key things. Can we honest political will? And can we ally the vested interest of the main stakeholders, whether or not we can achieve a just transition depend on this. I thank you and look forward to the discussion. <laughs>